This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 111. Coming up on Space Time, have scientists detected dark energy, a launch abort for Black Sky's new sounding rocket, and Southern Launch confirms TIE Space's Hapeth-1 rocket is damaged beyond repair. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study led by researchers from the University of Cambridge suggests that some unexplained results from the Xenon 1T experiment in Italy earlier this year may have been caused by dark energy and not the dark matter the experiment was designed to detect. The authors constructed a physical model to help explain the results, which may have originated from dark energy particles produced in a region of the Sun with a strong magnetic field, although future experiments would be required to confirm this explanation. The study, reported in the journal Physical Review D, could be an important step towards the detection of dark energy. Everything our eyes can see in the skies and in our everyday world, from ants to blue whales and cars to castles, make up less than 5% of the universe. All the rest is dark, meaning unknown. About 27% of this is referred to as dark matter, an invisible material which can only be detected through its gravitational influence holding galaxies and the cosmic web together. The remaining 68% is dark energy, which causes the universe to expand at an ever-accelerating rate. Large-scale experiments like Xenon-1T have been designed to directly detect dark matter particles by searching for signs of these particles when they collide with ordinary matter. But dark energy would be even more elusive than this. To detect dark energy, scientists generally look for gravitational interactions, the way gravity pulls objects around. On the very largest scales, the gravitational effect of dark energy is repulsive, pulling things away from each other and making the universe's rate of expansion accelerate. The Xenon-1T detector is located deep beneath the mountain at the Gran Sasso National Laboratory in Italy. The detector is filled with some 3.2 tons of ultra-pure liquefied xenon, which serves as a target for particle interactions. When a particle crosses the target, it knocks off free electrons and generates photons from the xenon atom. Most of these interactions occur from particles that are known to exist. Therefore, scientists need to carefully estimate the number of background events in the xenon-1T experiment. But about a year ago, when data from Xenon-1T was compared to known backgrounds, a surprising excess of 53 events over the expected 232 events was observed. And this raises an exciting question. Where is this excess coming from? Now, it must be pointed out these sort of excesses are often nothing more than flukes, just statistical anomalies. But once in a while, they can also lead to some fundamental new discoveries. Now, the signature was very similar to what could result from a tiny residual amount of tritium. That's an isotope of hydrogen containing a proton and two neutrons. And you'd only need a few tritium atoms for every 10 to the 25 xenon atoms to explain the excess. But it could also be a sign of something more exciting, such as the existence of a new hypothetical particle being produced by the Sun, a particle which has been dubbed a solar axion. Axions are hypothetical particles, which, if they exist, would preserve a time-reversal symmetry of the nuclear force, and the Sun could be a strong source of them. Now, while these solar axions are not dark matter candidates, their detection would mark the first observation of a well-motivated but never-detected class of new particles, and that would have a huge impact on science's understanding of fundamental physics as well as astrophysical phenomena. More importantly, axions produced in the early universe could well be a source of dark matter. However, exciting as all this sounds, the axion explanation really doesn't stand up to observations, since the amount of axions that would be required to explain the Xenon-1T signal would drastically alter the evolution of stars much more massive than the Sun, and that's simply in conflict with what we observe around us. Another possibility is that this could be an indication of a previously unknown property of neutrinos. 
Neutrinos are the most common particles in the universe, and they're extremely weakly interactive. In fact, there are trillions of them passing through your body right now, completely unhindered. It could be that the magnetic moment of neutrinos is larger than its value in the standard model of particle physics. And that would be a strong hint that there's some other new physics out there that would be needed to explain it. All in all, scientists are far from understanding what dark energy could be. But most physical models for dark energy would lead to the existence of a so-called fifth force in nature, a sort of vacuum energy working opposite to gravity. The existing four forces in nature are the electromagnetic force, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and gravity. Although, even with gravity, we're not sure it may just be an effect rather than a force. The thing is, we know that Einstein's theory of gravity works extremely well in the local universe. Therefore, any fifth force associated with dark energy is unwanted and must be hidden or screened when it comes to small scales, and would therefore only be operating on the very largest scales where Einstein's theory of gravity fails to explain the acceleration of the universe, at least not without a cosmological constant. To hide the fifth force, many models of dark energy are equipped with the so-called screening mechanism, which dynamically hides this fifth force. The authors of this new study constructed a physical model which used a type of screening mechanism known as chameleon screening in order to show that dark energy produced in the sun's strong magnetic fields really could explain the xenon 1T excess. They proposed that this chameleon screening shuts down the production of dark energy particles in very dense objects, therefore avoiding the problems faced by solar axions. And it would also allow scientists to decouple what happens in the local very dense universe from what's happening on the very largest scales, where density is extremely low. The researchers used their model to show what would happen in the detector if the dark energy was produced in a particular region of the sun called the tachocline, where magnetic fields are especially strong. Their calculations suggest that experiments like Xenon-1T, which are designed to detect dark matter, could also be used to detect dark energy. However, it's worth remembering that the original excess still needs to be convincingly confirmed. Scientists need to know it wasn't simply a statistical fluke. If Xenon-1T actually saw something new, then you'd expect to see similar excesses again in future experiments, but this time with much stronger signals. And if the excess was the result of dark energy, upcoming upgrades to the Xenon-1T experiment, as well as experiments pursuing similar goals, such as the Lux Zeppelin and the Panda XXT, means it could be possible to directly observe dark energy within the next decade. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. The maiden flight of Black Sky Aerospace's new sounding rocket has had to be aborted due to technical issues. The test flight from the company's launch facility near Gundawindi on the New South Wales-Queensland border had already been delayed once due to strong winds. Mission managers are looking at a program of four four-minute test flights from the new rocket, which will climb to an altitude of 35,000 feet in 38 seconds before parachuting back to the ground. The tests are designed to evaluate all aspects of a sovereign launch vehicle, including domestically developed rocket fuels, avionics, electronics and airframes. The company undertook its first commercial launch from its Gundawindi facility back in 2018, using its 5-metre Cyta 190 solid fuel sounding rocket on a suborbital ballistic trajectory. This is space time. Still to come. Southern Launch confirms Thai Space's Hapeth 1 rocket damaged beyond repair, and Jonathan Nally from Australian Sky and Telescope magazine tells us about some easy ways to begin backyard astronomy. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Southern launches confirmed that Thai Space's Hapeth 1 or Flying Squirrel rocket was damaged beyond repair after catching a light during last week's launch attempt. The company says it won't continue with any further launch attempts of this vehicle. An internal electrical fault in the rocket has been blamed for the failure. It was the third attempt to launch the rocket. 
The first was halted by high altitude winds, and a second launch attempt was scrubbed 30 minutes before liftoff after one of the launch sequence systems failed to come online. The flight was designed to test both the new rocket's hybrid fuel system and the environmental impact caused by vibration and noise from rocket flights from Southern Launch's new Whalers Way Orbital Launch Complex on the Air Peninsula south of Port Lincoln. Southern Launch has two more rocket launches planned before the end of the year. This is space time. Still to come, Jonathan Ali explains how we don't need expensive telescopes to begin sky watching, and later in the science report, a new study warns that sea level rise is likely to be far greater than predicted. All that and more still to come on space time. A new issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazines hit the newsstands. This month's issue looks at easy ways to begin backyard astronomy, which could set you or your kids on course to become citizen scientists. Joining us now with all the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. We have a complete guide to buying binoculars for astronomy. You know, most people think you've got to have a telescope and probably a big one in order to do any sort of stargazing. Um, well, that's just not, not the case, and it never has been the case. Uh, binoculars are actually a really good way to get into um, astronomy because you, you've got a nice wide field of view and they're easy to handle. Um, you, can, you can start to learn your way around the sky. You can use binoculars during the day for other purposes as well, whereas telescopes are quite clumsy for that. So binoculars are a really good way to get into it. And you know, there's been all sorts of standard advice over the years about which kind you should get and which size and that sort of thing and how much money you should spend. Well, the, the binocular uh, market, I guess you'd say, has changed quite a lot in recent years. So, uh, you know, there's a lot more technology and, uh, and prices have changed. So we, we have a complete guide to getting your first pair of binoculars, um, depending on what sort of stargazing you want to do. So um, if, if you're interested in getting into astronomy or you know someone who is, maybe a child, um, have a read of this because this, this will give you your best introduction in how to find your way around the night sky with a, an optical instrument. Now, we also have a look at how professional and amateur astronomers band together to do studies um, in, in, in science. It's, there's a lot more of this going on. And in particular, we, there's a group that's um, studying a, a funny star called R.W. Aurigae, which uh, seems to brighten and dim on very short time scales, very odd. They can't really figure out what's going on. Um, uh, it's, it's unlike other stars they've seen before. So there's got to be an explanation for it, and they're working together to try and sort it out. Um, so what is causing it, we don't really know yet. Maybe they've discovered some new kind of stellar mm. behaviour that they haven't seen before. Pulsating are very common. There are lots of them around, but the reasons why they're pulsating are often very different. It can be two stars orbiting each other and one is dimming out the light from the other, or it can be the star itself has got unusual properties inside it with uh, different gases whirling up at different times through the plasma. With Betelgeuse recently, we found a huge dust cloud that was that was causing it to dim. Yeah, something got, the dust cloud got in the way exactly. Yeah. So it was a dust cloud most... caused by the by Betelgeuse itself. It had a big puff of gas released, and then as the gas went further and further from the star, it cooled and became dust, which is what gas does when it's away from the star. And consequently... I'm, glad, I'm glad you described it as a puff of gas. I thought you were going to describe it some, in some other manner. But um, no, puff of gas sounds very nice, indeed. <laughs> a stellar that's flatulence. Nice, that's, that, that's, that's nice stellar behaviour. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing is easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study warns that the maximum sea level rise predicted in the most recent report to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is likely to be too low. 
The findings by Danish and Norwegian researchers reporting in the journal Ocean Science are based on calculations of future sea level rise based on actual observations of changing sea levels in the recent past compared with computer model-based predictions. The authors say the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates are too conservative because their models have never been tested against past patterns of sea level rise in order to check that they're accurate. A new study has found that male sleeping patterns are more strongly influenced by the lunar cycle than those of females. The findings reported in the Journal of the Total Environment aren't new, but previous studies have produced conflicting results on the association between the lunar cycle and sleep. The new study by scientists from Uppsala University included other potential issues, such as obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia. The new study looked at sleep recordings from 492 women and 360 men, finding that men whose sleep was recorded during nights in the moon's waxing phase exhibited lower sleep efficiency and increased time awake after sleep onset compared to men whose sleep was measured during times of the waning moon. In contrast, the sleep of women remained largely unaffected by the lunar cycle. During the waxing period, the amount of illuminated moon surfaces seen from Earth increases, and the moment the moon crosses the location's meridian gradually shifts to late evening hours. In contrast, during a waning period, the illuminated surface decreases, and the moment that the moon crosses the location's meridian gradually shifts to daylight hours. One mechanism through which the moon may impact sleep is sunlight reflected by the moon around the time when people usually go to bed. So, it's possible that the male brain is simply more responsive to ambient light than the brains of females. Now, while we're on the subject, a new study has found that spending less time in bed could help if you have trouble sleeping. A report in the journal Australian Prescriber claims changing behaviour around sleep, including setting regular sleep times and restricting the amount of time spent in bed, is an effective first-line therapy for insomnia. The authors found cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia should include improving sleep hygiene, restricting the time spent in bed, avoiding naps, relaxation strategies such as meditation, and cognitive therapy to challenge unhelpful beliefs and attitudes around sleep. They say drugs may be useful as a short-term approach during episodes of acute insomnia, as an add-on to behavioural therapy, or when there's a high level of distress. A new study claims a famous 3,700-year-old Babylonian clay tablet known as Plimpton 322 may be the world's oldest and most accurate trigonometry table. Scientists from the University of New South Wales who made the discovery claim the tablet may have been used by ancient mathematical scribes to calculate how to construct palaces and temples and build canals. The new research means the ancient Babylonians and not the Greeks were the first to study trigonometry. The Plimpton 322 tablet was discovered in the early 1900s in what is now southern Iraq by archaeologist Edgar Banks, upon whom the fictional character Indiana Jones was loosely based. The tablet has four columns and 15 rows of numbers written in cuneiform script using a base 60 system. The new research suggested the tablet describes the shapes of right-angle triangles using a novel kind of trigonometry based on ratios, not angles or circles. Trigonometry tables allow you to use one known ratio of the side of a right-angle triangle to determine the other two unknown ratios. The Greek astronomer Hipparchus, who lived around 120 BCE, has long been regarded as the father of trigonometry, and his table of chords on a circle considered the oldest trigonometric table. However, Plimpton 322 predates Hipparchus by more than a thousand years. The 15 rows on the tablet describe a sequence of 15 right-angled triangles, which are steadily decreasing the inclination. The left-hand edge of the table is broken, and new research suggests that there were originally 6 columns and 38 rows. They also demonstrate how the ancient scribes used a base 60 numerical arithmetic similar to our time clock, rather than the base 10 number system used today. It would have been used for surveying fields or for making architectural calculations for building palaces, temples or even step pyramids. The tablet, which is thought to have come from the ancient Sumerian city of Lhasa, has been dated to between 1822 and 1762 BCE. 
Well, be it Facebook, Instagram, or whatever social media you're on, chances are you've noticed the growing phenomena of the social influencer. People have built up a massive following, usually because they're hot and have developed a massive lifestyle others can only dream of. Now, if you're lucky enough to become a social influencer, companies will pay you to wear their clothes, to visit their venues, and to push their products. And it's usually nothing more than that. But as Tim Minham from Australian Skeptics points out, there are a growing number of social influencers who promote dangerous products, things that can really hurt you. Okay, there are influencers everywhere, okay? The influencers being people who um, who talk about their lives and their interests on uh, social media, on Facebook or wherever, Instagram, wherever they want to be. And they talk about everything from what they had for dinner. They go to a restaurant and say, look, this is a nice meal I had at this particular restaurant. Or they take up a certain product and say, I've used this product. And they influence because they have a lot of followers. And people who say, oh, that's interesting. I might do that too. Most of these, the influencers are young women, frankly, not all. But there's a lot of young women out there. And we have commented on them. One of them in Australia we actually won our Ben Spoon Award because of spreading medical information and about how certain cures work. And this is what Gwyneth Paltrow is offering, of course, as well with her products. But these are people online who are suggesting you try this this recipe, this mixture of uh, organic products, whatever, and it will cure your disease. And some of these diseases they're talking about are serious diseases. A lot of these influencers are also selling their own products, of course, and uh, those products themselves might be pretty chunky or dangerous or fatal. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who believe them. You get an attractive influencer who's got a good manner. They might be a celebrity in their own right, and their face is everywhere a as social chef. media works. <laughs> A failed chef, but there were um, slimy teas, everything from the, you know, tea, the drink, anything from that up to serums and things that are touted as cure-alls and all that sort of stuff. And some of them are harmless. I would suggest very few of them actually do what they're supposed to do, but some of them are harmless and some of them are not. Some of them have quasi-pharmaceuticals, if you like, and some of them are fatal. So there's a lot of this stuff in Malaysia, especially this is proving a big issue. The Malaysia's version of our Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is the National Pharmaceutical Regulation, regulatory agency has listed 171 health and beauty products that it has found contain banned ingredients, including mercury and a particular treatment for acne and another one for leukemia medication that has side effects from skin irritation and hair loss to birth defects in unborn children. This is stuff being promoted by these influencers online and they're trying to stop it. But of course, the trouble is uh, you've really got to throw a few people in jail, I think, for the mess to sink in. But this is because of social media, because of freedom of speech on social media, but if you're selling chunky products, you're selling dangerous products, and you're not a qualified person to even comment on it, apart from being a celebrity and online, it's the sort of stuff that really should be clamped down on. But it's an ongoing thing, and the influencers make money out of this stuff, and some of them can make a quite a good living out of their influence and the number of followers they have and the amount of stuff they sell. So influence is not just about, I had a nice meal at a restaurant. It's about selling products and making money out of people's um, potential misfortunes. And that's what's happening in Malaysia. It happens here. It happens around the world. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, 
through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.